Hello, welcome to the Calm Blue Podcast. That was a very technical intro for half ten on a Thursday evening. My name's Dan Rollins, and I'm joined here by John Townley on deadline day, everyone's favourite day of the year, I'm sure. And Aston Villa have been pretty busy for a change, John. Makes a change, doesn't it? Yes, quite a few deals done today. Obviously, a lot kind of in the pipeline leading up to deadline day, and um, you know, not not loads of money spent over the course of the month. But yeah, a busier deadline day than usual, I suppose. Not mm-hmm. you know, any kind of star additions to the first team squad necessarily. But um, as we got on to, I think a window that was always going to be uh, quite a slow one uh, has ended with, I suppose, a flurry of activity. Mm-hmm. Yes, I've worked out before we joined that I've worked for Reach for since 2019 and I've done, this is my ninth deadline day, my ninth transfer window. And I was very excited when I first joined the company at the thought of working in a, in a in a business where you work with some of the work is transfers and deadline day. And the first couple were dead boring. Nothing happened. This is back in the old days when we were in the office and we'd have pizza and stuff for all the employees. And it was like a really like big thing. And it'd be so anticlimactic that nothing would happen. Uh, so more exciting than usual. Like you said, not a lot of money spent, but um, what, two signings to the door on deadline day? No, Morgan Rogers as well. Three signings done on deadline day. That's unheard of for Villa. Like, I, I went back through like the signings that we've made in previous uh, windows, and I was about to say this is our busiest, busiest January window, which is untrue. But busiest deadline day in the time that I've worked here, at least, is, is true. Three players through the door. Uh, we're going to talk about all of them. Um, and the outgoings as well. We're going to grade the transfer window, which is something we do quite a lot on Claret and Blue, kind of like grading transfers or grading uh, the season and stuff like that. I will say that the thumbnail for this video features an A+, which I don't fully agree with, <laughs> but it, I thought it looked the best as a, for a YouTube thumbnail. So can you call that clickbait? Maybe. Um, but we will grade the window. Maybe, John, you will have an A+, and my thumbnail will be justified. But personally, I, I don't think I will go for that. Uh, as I said, then we'll go through player by player. It's half 10 on Thursday evening. The window slams shut, as we all know, at 11 o'clock. So if anything happens in the next half an hour while we're on air, obviously we will react to that. Uh, but it's four signings in January to talk about. We'll start with the biggest one, I suppose, in terms of financial outlay. Morgan Rogers, I think it's a guaranteed 8 million up front to Middlesbrough with bonuses up to 15 or 16, depending on various different sources. Um, and those... Um, uh, what's the word like <laughs> bonuses um, yeah. are like variable on different things that the player or the club has to achieve uh, as a guess this is something that people obviously talk about based off football manager where you sign a player and say well if you play 50 games for England the club gets another million or if we win the FA Cup you get 500,000 whatever it is we don't actually know uh, but you would assume some of those bonuses on the higher end are going to be difficult to achieve and maybe that we don't actually pay anywhere near 15 million because those bonuses are never achieved. Would that be fair? <laughs> yeah, it is 8 million up front, you know, fixed payment, and then it's rising to 15. And those are, you know, we don't know exactly how they're broken down, but if it's going to get to 15, it's going to be a long term um, mm. a bunch of clauses. Uh, speaking as people at Villa, one of them was mentioned of, you know, kind of hundreds of, per- hundreds of appearances for Villa. So, you know, you're looking kind of years down the line that Villa would outlay up to 15 million for Rogers. So I think as a standard, as I say, fixed payment of eight million pounds, just as a kind of, um, you know, first installment, then I think it's a very good deal. Um, I mentioned previously on the podcast that I like Rogers. I like uh, his kind of raw ability, it's similar to kind of, I don't know, like John Duran in a way that he, he looks like he's got a bit of everything there and all the attributes skills and qualities needed to um you know become a top player and this is obviously uh, a player that joined man city uh comes with a lot of pedigree headhunted by i can't pronounce his name unfortunately manchester city's director of football um i think pep calls him cheeky or something or che- cheeky or something I don't I quite know it starts much. with a t and it's got two x's in it hasn't it in his first uh, name yeah 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 um yeah. And he doesn't usually get involved with academy recruitment. So for him to kind of, you know, use um, Rogers as a priority signing back in 2019, I think that says a lot about his ability then. Uh, and every player, they develop differently. I think that's also key to remember. You know, some players will do a Jude Bellingham, uh, Lewis Miley, for example, for Newcastle, not, you know, the, the, the Two exact very same. Players, <laughs> yes. So in terms of it's 17 years old, they're, they're playing. You know, top level football already. Um, and Morgan Rogers, when he joined Man City, was that age, but he didn't make an appearance for 
the first team. But that's not to say that Rogers can't become uh, a top player in the future because, as I say, everyone develops differently. So, um, yeah, he's under, you know, the, the perfect stewardship, really, for his point in his career. He's a player that's, you know, speaking to people who know him um, better than anyone. He is someone who is driven to improve. He... Similar again to Bellingham. Um, in fact, they, you know, he knows Bellingham well, having come through the youth ranks in England, etc. Being in Hales Owen, uh, Jude came from obviously Stourbridge, so uh, neighbouring. Big big rivalry there. Yeah, but they knew uh, each other's family as well. So um, yeah, very similar in terms of their mentalities and their kind of drive to improve as footballers uh, and their grounding as well. So for me, that you know, it comes across as. Roger is coming to the club to improve and he will want to stay for two hour meetings with Emery to do his individual analysis, collective analysis. They do a body more heat and that sort of stuff. Um, Cause he's very grateful for the opportunity as well. Obviously his career was, I want to say at a crossroads when, um, you know, when he was, wasn't playing too much at Blackpool, wasn't playing at all really at Bournemouth on those loan moves. Um, Middlesbrough gave him a big opportunity and he took it. And that's why he's here now at Villa. But, I wrote in a piece that I think will be in the comments somewhere, Dan, maybe if we can link it. Um, those loan moves are just as important sometimes, just to have them rather than just playing sometimes. You know, without having those appearances, you still learn an awful lot about yourself uh, and about yourself as a footballer as well, which is key and how, you know, you, you're going to be working in different clubs and with different people, different players, uh, playing against different teams with different pressures as well. He was going for promotion with Bournemouth, then fire relegation with Blackpool on different low moves as well. So there's plenty that Morgan Rogers is returning to the West Midlands with, you know, five years of experiences um, and, you know, just the general fact that he is a very good footballer and he will improve under an Imery. For that reason, I think £8 million is um, a perfectly good deal, especially in this world. <laughs> you know, players these days go for 40 50 million if they're half decent in the Premier League. So if Rogers can have... Um, you know, a nice six months with us, develop, and then next year, you know, have more experiences and continue to improve. I think we've got a good, very, very good player on our hands in the coming years. Yeah, we spoke about this on a previous episode. That I said it was very low risk, potential high reward, and even at the full fifteen million, I still think in this market that that's an okay fee for a player that can uh, can bring you goals and assists, which will be kind of end game for him. But closer to eight to ten million, you know, it's like we said we don't don't know the specifics of some of those bonuses, but if some of them are hundreds of, of appearances for Villa, and then that triggers a, a one million to, to Middlesbrough in five years' time. So he's made five hundred appearances. He's you're not going to think twice, are you? Because obviously that's a great, a great business. Um, so you know, ten, eleven million or something for a player that will will continue to improve. I do think the the returning back to the West Midlands thing will be a big thing for him. The talks about struggling elsewhere and stuff like that. Some of that could be personal life and, and being outside of your your home comforts and stuff. Being back at Villa, I'm from Howes Owen, so it's not not too far away. Uh, as is Matt Kendrick, so. Um, you know, being back with with family and friends, but in, in your local area, can make a massive difference to your your personality and your confidence and whatnot, and that can translate to the football pitch. So, I'm really he's, excited about about Rogers. He's coming to a squad as well that he already knows. Jacob Ramsey he knows Kane Kessler from um, England youth teams. He knows Tim Rubenham as well. Obviously, Steve Hopcroft, Mark Harrison worked with him at West Brom, plus more staff as well. So he's walking into a dressing room, you know, full of. First of experienced pros, you John McGinn's, um, Ollie Watkins now is an experienced pro. We have World Cup winner and Emmy Martinez. You know, he doesn't need to have the kind of comfort of knowing Ramsey and Kane and Tim, but that just helps again. Um, and it's clear that we have a very good dressing room in that sense. So all of that, as you said, Dan, is very conducive to Rogers, you know, stepping foot up into body more straight away and just cracking on and developing as a footballer. And that's, that's exactly what we want him to do. Um, so I think yeah, there's plenty of reasons why he ticks all the boxes. And as well, you know, Emery isn't signing this player without going to, as I say, Mark Harris and Steve Hopcroft, those guys, and asking for references on the character as well. And as I said, speaking to people who are close to him, you know, it's a player that already I really want to um, see succeed at Villa. And he's saying all the right things too. He said it's, you know, an honour to join Villa and it's his dream come true to be playing at the top of the Premier League, playing in Europe. Um, you know, growing up, he was a West Brom fan. But I think, to be honest, once you're a professional footballer and you can see where your career is going and you can see that Villa is definitely the club for you, um, those things, you know, they wear away, don't they? So I don't want to see any kind of comments about um, where his previous allegiances were, etc. It all goes out the window once you're kind of at the yeah. top. I mean, yeah. 
Yeah, we're going to include some comments in a second. There's two kind of probably stupid points I'm going to make, and if this wasn't live, I'd probably end up cutting these out. But I'm going to go from anywhere because it's late and why not? Uh, I basically took both of these from social media, so I can't claim credit for them. But just on the way he looked, both physically and on the pitch, I'm going to make very two stupid points here. I'm sure somebody said that like when they saw him in the training pictures, they're like he looks he looks similar to Ollie Watkins because they got like the same hairstyle, like quite big big lads. You know, they saw a picture in training, it was like oh, I thought it was Ollie Watkins to begin with. There are some similarities to be fair. Uh, good looking chap, big strong chap as well. Like, is he six three, yeah. six four. Like the picture of him next to Emery and Monchi, he looks massive. He's only twenty one, and you'd expect he's probably. Uh, finished growing and stuff by then but you know physically will go on to develop over the next probably year or two as well a, a, a little bit in the gym and stuff like that so that's that's great yeah um, so i was just gonna go interrupt danny He's, he always has been kind of ahead of his years in that sense um physically he's you know he dominated um the kind of the youth league as we all know because he was so highly regarded um when he was coming through as a teenager i was speaking to one of his former coaches at Hallis, Hall Hallis Hawks, maybe. I think that's what they're called. Sorry, I don't know the pronunciation. Bang on. But at five years old, when they would teach kids to kind of just kick the ball towards the goal, he was hitting it over the bar. Um, and that that kind of character of being um, someone who's you know, not just very uh, technically gifted and had a natural ability from a very young age, he was playing up his ages almost his whole mm. career, I suppose. I mean... You know, to be 21 and playing in the Premier League, you know, a lot, a lot of players won't have the opportunity even then. So, um, yeah, playing with like under 10s at six years old and that continued. Joining Man City as a, as a 17 year old, as I say, you know, you don't do that without being, you know, <laughs> I, I suppose you could say a specimen, you know, even at his younger ages. Um, and now, as I say, it's, it's learning those te it's more, more technical, more tactical elements, I think, is now the key mm. part, a part that he will definitely want to learn and improve on. And we'll get that from someone like Unai Emery, of course. He, he, he will nurture that player and develop him. And it, it's got the, the hallmarks to be a really potential, a really exciting potential signing. Um, then that piece you mentioned, and we will put it in the podcast notes, the description down below, uh, like the in-depth piece about Morgan Rogers, the, the Hallis Hawks, uh, like training notes from under sevens and under tens or whatever it was. It's got yeah. like 70 goals in, in the under sevens, which I, I love stuff like that. Kids just scoring loads and loads of goals. Uh, if you can do 70 goals in the Premier League, we're, we're definitely onto something. Uh, the other point I was going to make that is stupid, and this is something I noticed, this, this is stupid. There's the, the clip of him scoring in the Carabao Cup we did the rounds on social media is the other one where he kind of like goes one way then the other and then bends it in in the in the far right corner do you know who that's against somebody in a red kit uh is it extra maybe uh, i'm not watching yeah it was, a, it was a lower league so I don't, I don't know who it was so but that clip <laughs> this is so silly that when that clip initially first started playing on my feed as i was just scrolling through it reminded me and he's nothing like him physically in the way that he looks, uh, you know, in terms of like the, the build and stuff. But that little movement reminded me of Grealish, and the just the colours of the kit was like the Grealish Rotherham <laughs> match in that yeah. purple kit because the opposition is red. The Middlesbrough kit is purpley blue, but that kind of like faint one way and then the other is like that's Grealish vibes is what I thought. So when I just scrolled past it and didn't read any of it and just saw the goal, I thought, oh, that's a Grealish goal. And I thought, oh no, it isn't. He's Six foot four lad who looks nothing like Jack Grealish doesn't play anything like him, but if he's got those little moments, I was like, oh, just play there. I can <laughs> take, it a step further, take it a step further and say his goal against Chelsea when he cut in and bent it right on me of Benteke against Crystal Palace away, 1 0 in yeah. 20. Yeah, yeah. 50, I think. Sellers Park. But yeah, we're going to go down a really long rabbit hole there. So <laughs> we should go to 11. But yeah, a player who's got a lot of um, technical ability, but a you know, someone who with Emery is going to continue to improve tactically. And that's, I think, the key point. And by the way, just as a side note, Michael Carrick, uh, Appleton as well, the two managers who he's best performed under Lincoln and um, Middlesbrough, are both, you know, quite similar in terms of how they um, operate as well. And I think that's, you know, Carrick especially probably quite similar to Emery and they're kind of meticulous in their planning, um, you know, preparation for games, that sort of stuff. So he's thriving under that whereas you know a Mick McCarthy at Blackpool didn't work so much Scott Parker didn't work so much <coughs> for different reasons granted um but yeah really excited to see how Rogers develops at Villa yeah definitely that guy was extra John you were right it's just popped up on my timeline so I've retweeted it onto mine uh if anyone watches it from from the the wide angle rather than the close-up and has in mind Greenish in the the Rotherham game in the purple kit maybe you'll see the comparison that I saw earlier uh, right, a couple of comments. Morning all, says Brett Leader, 9.30am here in Sydney. Uh, whilst Ian says, evening, gents. So, two sides of the country there. It is evening for us as well. Quarter to 11. Uh, Marine Boy yeah, says, uh, a good... 
Can get Britain as a Gauchi uh, loan. Well, well, we was going to talk about Gauchi towards the end, but we'll do him second if you like. I had a fan message me on Instagram yesterday saying if we sign Joe Gauchi. Uh, I can give you some information if you want. I've seen him play. I am a fan of the club that he plays for over there. That I've definitely forgotten, uh, and a Villa fan as well. So if you want to uh, have a chat about him, you you can ask me anything. And I said, oh yeah, I will do. Actually, do you just want to come on the podcast for five minutes, ten minutes, and tell us a little bit about him. And he said yes. So that might be something we we do in uh, in the coming weeks. <laughs> <laughs> who he is everyone uh, no I haven't sorted that for this but maybe in the future we'll get that sorted uh, yeah. Marine Boys had a good transfer window building for the future instead of plugging holes in the damn wall um, Sean Reynolds says it should be quite an easy transition for him to settle straight away that's Morgan Rogers he also says I take it we're definitely done now as you're on live John uh, yeah we expect Villa not to do any further business but if they do obviously we're here to react to it live if it does happen uh, something out of the blue but uh, it seems that that won't be the case uh, maybe a youth player or something, John, potentially, you said? Uh, yeah, possibly so. Um, well, we're 15 minutes away from the deadline now, so don't expect any more incomings for the first team. Um, kind of as a side note, Callum Chambers looks like he's going to be staying. You know, obviously, we've seen Troy Ray um, mutually terminate his contract, but Chambers mm. was in talk with West Brom, a couple of other clubs as well. Hull City were interested, but move never... Um, got completed their owner came on sky sports actually earlier and said that as well to yeah kind of re-emphasize that so um yeah champion looks like he's staying uh that's kind of the only i suppose relevant first team thing at the moment yeah, <laughs> everything else I think so. yeah uh nate says this is the last one on rogers because we'll move on to the other signings do you think rogers comes into the match day squad or is he just here for depth slash future I think probably you mean first 11 I think he'll certainly be in the, in the match day squad first 11 is probably a different answer John do you think he comes straight in and starts games well no not straight away um I don't think anyone course, does do that straight away he can, make debut, he can make his debut against Sheffield United obviously I think mm. if memory serves correctly deadline day is usually quite close to or close to games uh, I remember it was last year I think and it was a case of like oh clubs need to get their business done by 12 to mm. have ready for Saturday but obviously yeah um, yeah he can play against Sheffield and I'd fully expect him to be in the squad for that game whether he starts many games this season I'd be surprised if I'm totally honest because we have quite a lot of depth you know injury permitting you've you know got Bailey, Diaby, Tielemans, Ramsey there's a lot of competition um, but yeah Rogers signed a five and a half year deal till 2029 so there's no rush to start games straight away. Mm. Yeah exactly um right i think we'll move on let's go to gauchi next i think uh another question from nate actually who's in here twice uh leading the narrative of the show will gauchi be number two to emmy or number three after olsen um so the latest signing not doing these in order joe gauchi the most recent signing confirmed at 10 o'clock i think or half 10 quarter past 10 i can't remember uh goalkeeper currently playing in the asia cup with australia on, on international duty uh, 23 years old is it adelaide he came from i, I think i've just seen scrolling through twitter yeah, I've just seen a, a clip of him making a, a good save. Obviously, a very different level in Australia to to the Premier League. He's not going to be coming in to uh, be starting games over Emi Martinez. We can at least guarantee that. But you suspect, maybe if not immediately, this is Robin Olsen's replacement, isn't it? Well, certainly competition to start with. Um, yeah. Replacement, yeah, in the long term. You'd, yeah, for sure. Um, expect Olsen Emerson. to leave in the summer, I would say. I'm not sure. I, I don't think there's like a rush for him, uh, you know, to, unless he wants to be playing, which, you know, judging by the fact that he's been happy to be the backup for Martinez for a while now, I don't think there's a rush for him to want to play games. I'm not sure. Um, but so I've completely lost my train of thought there, Dan. Uh, Gauchi, yes, he is 23. Villa have tracked a number of young goalkeepers. Obviously, they put in a bid for the... Um, Icelandic keeper hack on something that I think signed for Brentford. I think he signed for Brentford in the end. Um, and yeah, they've landed at Joe Gauchi. And I'm, I don't know this for certain, and I haven't asked it either yet. But um, Villa's new under 21 manager, who's called Pep Gambawi or Gambiao. I'm really bad with butcher names in this podcast all the time. But he spent about seven or eight years, I think, in Australia. Um, worked as Andrew Postecoglou's assistant, worked at Adelaide for a couple of years, I believe, and uh, Western Sydney Wanderers, I think, as well. So while Joe um, Gauchi wouldn't have been playing at that time, at least uh, as a senior player, when Gambawi was down under, then 
what I would suggest is he's probably just helped with the scouting and he's probably um, got lots of contacts and he's obviously well connected in Australia still. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he led some sort of um, push to bring uh, Gauchi to the club because it's a bit of a kind of a random um, link, I su- you know, I suppose. So, yeah, I don't know too much about Gauchi. I can't confess that I do. But, yeah, um, clearly done well enough to get a call up for the Australia team. He hasn't played in the Asia Cup yet, but that's because Matt Ryan's the captain and obviously playing at a decent level, played against Villa twice, obviously, for AZ Alkmaar too. But he's kind of coming to the end of his career, I think, now at the, like, the highest level. So, Gauchi is clearly a goalkeeper who uh, is rated very highly. It would be good to get um, Bosnich's take on him. It's something that I should I should probably ask Bosnich if he wants to come on the podcast and do an interview with us. That would be good. Um, I'm sure he's probably done it on Sky or something, to be fair. But yeah, um, don't know too much about Gauchi, but it's yeah, a player. Villa wanted a younger keeper to come in. They've obviously loaned out Marshall. So um, yeah, let's see how he goes. Yeah, absolutely. And you've made a promise there to get Mark Bosnich on the podcast, so we will all be holding you to to that one. Uh, you could say that a lot, about a lot of the players we've signed this January, to be honest, that you know don't know much about him, not seen a lot of him, a lot of potential, potential there, a young player. There was a comment earlier on, uh, this will be a window that you can ask us in four years if it was a good transfer window or not, says Darren. Yeah, it's not going to be one that you, uh, oh, there it is. Uh, this is not going to be one that you look at probably even in six months and go, oh, that was a brilliant transfer window because we won't even have seen Costa yeah. and, and Djokovic play yet because he's gone obviously back out on loan to his parent club. Um, I think you can um, ask the question of Villa stronger. I think that's a valid question. Are they stronger than what they started the window? But yeah, in terms of was it a good window? Were, you know, were they good buys? Good yeah. signings. Yeah, yeah, it's going to take a while to know that. Yeah. Um, I, I think I think I think Villa are stronger overall. But we'll do that. We'll do that at the end. Um, Costa and Djokovic is something that we've kind of already spoken about on the Q&A episode that we did a couple of weeks ago uh, in the studio. Uh, I think that pronunciation is right. That's what I'm sticking with until I'm told otherwise. Uh, Serbian right back, 18 years old, has gone back on loan to Red Star Belgrade for the rest of this season. Uh, we'll see what develops with him, whether he even plays for Villa next season or not, or whether he has another loan in a different league is, is, is a possibility, uh, not as a an insight into any information but as a as a theory I could see him going out on loan to a, a side in the championship or something for example uh, rather than just coming straight back although there is the possibility that he comes back uh, and he's fighting for a place with Matty Cash and Kane Kessel Hayden but um, yeah we'll, we'll be one that has to wait and see is there anything else really to add about Angelkovic for you? No I'm um, speaking to someone in uh, Serbia they mentioned that and I don't know how true this is, or it might have just been tongue in cheek, but they said that Monchi said that um, he wanted, uh, I forget his name now, sorry, it's, it, it's late. What's his first name again, Dan Costa? Costa. Um, that he want, Monchi said to Costa, oh, I wanted to keep you um, for the rest of the season. But, I, you know, I, maybe that's tongue in cheek, or maybe they just lied to me, I don't know. But um, I put it out there now. So I think, yeah, certainly a play that, you know, again, will be um, kind of assessed during pre-season. We don't know what level he is yet. Obviously, he's played a handful of Champions League games. He's only made his senior debut back in August. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a massive step up for him. And that's something he'll probably feel once he plays, or once, sorry, once he trains just with his teammates in pre-season. So, they'll get a proper view of him then. But again, we're talking about an 18-year-old. There's, you know, I mentioned earlier, there's not many players who play regularly in the Premier League at 21, let alone 18. So he's got three, four, five years potentially to get up to the level. And then that's when his um, you know, contract would be up. And obviously, if he plays well, then he'd be getting a new deals. And that's how it works in the professional games. So, yeah, we'll see about uh, Costa what happens in the summer. But I'm um, with you, Dan. I, I don't know whether there'll be a loan. That's just something that we'll have to see later on. Again, maybe we should link that. He said they didn't comment again. Serbian expert I spoke to kind of mentioned that he's very athletic, he's quite, um, you know, powerful, he's very quick, but there's obviously elements of his game that need to be refined. He does, he wouldn't expect him to kind of tuck inside and play as like a midfielder, like a lot of modern fullbacks do, is more of a traditional fullback. And yeah, compared him to Dumfries, if there was like a, a, a comparison that um, could be made to like a household name, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, uh, link me any pieces you want in the description and I'll, I'll drop those in after we go off air. Uh, the other part that we've not spoken about is uh, Lino Sousa. Uh, I think that that's the correct pronunciation, a, a left-sided fullback, a youngster from Arsenal who's gone straight out on loan to Plymouth. That came totally out of left field, didn't it? I think that was only 
talked about today, and it was just like, yeah, he signed. I thought the announcement for that was was funny. You, am I wrong here? The way you you react in your face looks oh, like yeah, it's uh, Susie, is this? Susie, yeah. Yeah, well, um, it was a few days ago that he was linked. And, um, oh, was it? Okay, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> I could tell I said something wrong by the, the look on your face. I thought I'd... Uh, yeah, that's 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 yeah, Lionel Sousa, all right, linked a couple of days ago, all confirmed today. Uh, Ireland really took notice of it this morning. I think Fabrizio Romano was like, yeah, he's joining. I was like, whoa, where, where did that come from? Um, yeah, again, don't really know, know much about him. He's been on the, on the bench for Arsenal in the FA Cup recently against Liverpool, uh, but it's been playing for the uh, Arsenal Academy. He came from West Brom's Academy as well. Is this the one? Or am I getting mixed up with another? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course he is. <laughs> uh, yeah, anyone who's been released from the West Brom Academy has got a chance of making their way to Villa one day by the looks of it. Um, yeah, the announcement for that was funny. That I say funny, probably isn't. Uh, that Plymouth just tweeted <laughs> out of nowhere before Arsenal all Villa did and just said, Villa have signed this player from Arsenal and he's on loan at us now. <laughs> the way they worded it was great. Um, so he's uh, signed for Villa on a four-year deal, I think, and has gone out on loan for the, the season, for the rest of the championship season. And again, will be assessed in the summer, whether he needs a, another loan for next year where he comes back in. Again, you kind of look at the two full-back signings on both sides as, well, maybe that's, is, this is a move to move Matty Cash on the right and replace with Ndelkovic and Kane Kessler-Hayden and possibly one other. Uh, and for the left-hand side, Sousa comes back, Luca Dean goes, Moreno is your first choice, Sousa is your backup, and you get rid of Dean's high wages. Is that a, p- a possible theory? Uh, anything's a theory. Um, yeah, I, I think it's interesting that they're quite similar in terms of their profiles, and, and Costa and um, Sousa, because they're both uh, powerful players, physically able. Um, I think they're probably both six foot. Don't know about Costa actually. In fact, I think he might be taller than six foot. Um, yeah, so interesting that those are the two profiles that we've gone for. Um, another player that I'm really excited for, I keep saying that, but you know, he gets a move to Arsenal. Villa wanted to sign him at the time that he left West Brom, which is in 2022. Obviously, there's been a lot of um, West Brom or players that have directly come from West Brom or have left the club or have left the club to go somewhere else, like uh, Sousa. And ended up at Villa. Mark Harrison joined the club in 2019. And since then, there's been, I don't know how many players. I, I put a list down earlier and I don't know off the top of my head, but there's more than 10. So, um, yeah, I I haven't watched Sousa play before. I don't expect many people to have either. But just based off what some people um, have been saying who cover Arsenal, they said that they're probably a bit surprised that he didn't get uh, more of an opportunity when Zinchenko has been injured and their other left back, I forget who they've got now. Um, but yeah, a player that I think is probably a bit of a coup by Villa to, to bring into the club. Um, and then again, it's probably quite an easy sell, I think, in some ways, because we have a plan for him. We haven't just said to him, would you like to join us? Because we sign a lot of West Brom players and, you know, one day you might make it. We've said to him, this is our plan for you. You're going to go on loan to Plymouth and work under Ian Foster, who obviously knows him very well too. Ian Foster, if you don't, if, you know, the audience don't know, is a uh, former England youth coach worked from the under 18s to under 20s for a few years i don't think he works directly with uh, susa but obviously he knows of him um and yeah villa probably owe plymouth one for <laughs> taking kesler back taking zaz off him and uh putting him into middlesbrough but um yeah really exciting again because of the profile that he is i think for susa again comes with a lot of pedigree and um clearly highly rated or was highly rated at arsenal um, but a move to Villa and the kind of opportunity that he's now going to get, I think that's something that you certainly couldn't turn down. Yeah, definitely. I'm oh, sorry I was on mute because I keep having to blow my nose. Um, that's all for the incomings then. The, we are about to hit the deadline. And as we said, we didn't expect Villa to do any further business, barring a late surprise out of nowhere. Um, let's talk out very quickly. Uh, we've not really done these on the podcast, despite Dendonka leaving early in the week or last week. Uh, Dendonka's gone to Napoli on loan with a, an option to buy, was it, rather than an obligation? Um, option to buy, Dendonka, yeah. Seven, yeah, option to buy. Seven, seven or eight million. Yes, seven or eight million pounds, yeah. Um, Is that pounds or euros? Pounds, euro, not million euros. Oh. Yeah, yeah, not 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 bad. I think that's okay if if he does enough for, for them to activate it. Um, obviously, we've spoken about Chambers a little bit, who looked like he might be on the way out today to a Championship Club. It looks like he'll be staying, buying again a late surprise out of nowhere. Um, 
Josh Feeney and Tommy O'Reilly is an interesting one. Gone to Rao Union, uh, mm. obviously the the club for Unai Emery's family. We did wonder, didn't we, whether that would be the case when that deal was announced with um, Naz and Wes to, to put a, a, a stake in the club or, or whatever the phrase is, that would yeah. there be any kind of player training going on there between the sides. That's a great experience, isn't it? For a couple of our youngsters to go over there together, the picture of them in the airport is is great, isn't it? It's like parents sending their kids off on holiday for the first time. Uh, two young lads still in the airport with their suitcases to fly off to Spain. Um, but yeah, great little experience for them for that and, and to, to kind of be embedded in the group of you know, uh, V Sports or whatever. Not that much much difference to them, but um, to be to be linked with the club still and go over there and, and play play games and play minutes is yeah, I think it's a really interesting move. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um... That's going to happen more as well in the summer uh, with Real Union. I was speaking to a chap uh, who's based over there, and is it Iron? Iron? I think it's Iron. And he was saying there's not much space in their squad at the moment, so they probably would have liked to have taken more Villa players over <clears throat> this month. But this summer will give them a more a bit better opportunity to do that. Sorry, uh, he's particularly interested by Josh Feeney because apparently their defence isn't very good. Um, so hopefully he can show it for them. But I think. You know, Tommy O'Reilly is probably going to go there and rip it up. To be fair, it's the third tier of Spanish football, so the basis of the basis of it is, as I mentioned earlier, Morgan Rogers is to get an experience. It's not to say to Tommy O'Reilly and Josh Feeney, "This is your level, and you know this is you know kind of where you need to be playing at, or where not your level." But do you know what I mean? That's not the point. It, the point is, it's a different country. It's them living away from. Yeah, uh, you can uh, almost look at it as like a derogatory move to go. You're not Premier League standard. You're third tier of Spain. Like that's how how badly yeah. we rate you. But it's not. Uh, it's, it's like you say the experience of it and all the all the things that come with it. The the kind of contributions on the pitch. Not that they're irrelevant, but it's. If they, you know, if Tom O'Reilly goes there and scores two goals or something, we'll go. Oh, that's rubbish. That's not yeah, really yeah. the point to an extent. Always look at Karen Archer when he went to uh, my the, the club around my uh, my ends in Sully Moors. Um, he scored a couple of goals at Sully Moors, then he comes back to Villa and scores more goals in one game than he did, I think, anyway, <laughs> um, for like a whole season in the National League. So and now he's a Premier League footballer. So yeah, there's again, there's no fixed way of developing his footballer, but getting all of these all of these experiences and opportunities certainly help. Um, and I, I do think it will help them, um, you know, kind of adapting to a new culture, a new way of playing football as well. And it's not going to be all completely new. They're going to be working with the under-21 coach who Villa appointed in the summer, but then left in December. Again, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I think it's Inigo Idiakes or something. Um, he is now the Real Union head coach. So he'll know them. He'll be familiar with them. And ultimately, it is a results-driven business still. You know, Real Union isn't just a football club who... Um, you know, it doesn't take it seriously. They're going to want to win games. And that's something that Tommy and Josh are going to have to feel as well. Again, like I said earlier, with Morgan Rogers, feel different pressures as well. Um, so a really interesting experience for them. They need to make full use of it. They've got, what, five months or so there, uh, four or five months to really, um, yeah, grasp the opportunity. And hopefully they'll come back and they'll be even, you know, better, more readily equipped footballers um, as a result. And as I say, in the summer, there'll be more players that can go over there. Um, once Real Union have a bigger um, capacity to bring more players in. Hmm. Yeah, really interesting. Uh, we'll see how that develops in the summer. The other one is Bertrand Traore, who's uh, joined Villarreal after a, a contract termination, which I think is um, an agreement on both sides, whether he's had his contract paid off or part of his contract paid off to, to kind of get him out, basically. Uh, it kind of feels like a long time coming, doesn't it? Bertrand Traore leaving the club. I feel like we've probably spoken about this for couple of seasons now, a couple of windows at least. Um, some nice moments of Bertrand Traore, a couple of goals swing to mind as highlights, but overall didn't do a fat lot for us today and doesn't, you know, not going to be a great miss. He, he's fit for Burkina Faso, but never fit for Villas, how it feels. Yeah, it, yeah, it appears that way. Um, yeah, I was, I'll be totally honest, I was a bit surprised that he's, uh, that there was a mutual termination, termination, um, but I guess, you know, fair play to him, he wants to be playing football and there wasn't any suitors for him to be paying money. So that is the only way to, uh, you know, kind of, I suppose, Villa cut their losses in terms of wages. But then, um, yeah, for Troy to play football as well, it's a six-month deal, I think, he's got with Villarreal, which, again, is a good opportunity for him. So, uh, you know, in the end, I think it's probably worked out for everyone in terms of a, a deadline day, you know, scenario, because Villa was just yeah. saying, we'll never get any money from it. I don't think this was our last opportunity. 
I wonder if in this summer we had any offers for him. And if we did, we probably should have accepted them. But hey, it's you know it's gone now. Uh, Troy, or I think, to be honest, will be remembered more. I know a lot of fans will probably shout at the screens now, but I, I remember him more kind of fondly than anything else. And I know it was a relatively big outlay. It was like, what, 19, 18, 19 million pounds that we paid for him. Was it? But I remember some... Is yeah. it that much? Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No way. I remember some big moments from obviously the Leicester goal last season, but then, you know, just the goal he scored against Man United was outrageous in the lockdown season. I think we lost that game 3-1 or something. And then the goal against West Brom as well. So... He gave us some nice moments. Um, most of his career at Villa was spent injured. And I'd like to know, actually, it's probably a good stat, how many games he played in front of fans because his hmm. first his first season was obviously behind closed doors, I think, the whole the whole time. And then after then, I think he's probably only made about 30 appearances, if that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate he had so many injuries, but a player who... You know, was never going to kind of light up the Premier League, but he certainly gave us some moments. Yeah, I'm. I've just been looking for transfer market as you were talking. I'm absolutely staggered that they reported for it was 18 million euros when we signed him from Leon. Oh, I had no idea it was that much. Right, I, I, was was nine, like eight. I think it was 19 with our add ons up to 19. So I don't know if it matched that figure. But. No, you wouldn't have thought so, but Christ, I don't think it was anywhere near that. that 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 puts the the, the signing down in my estimations. Like I remember him for some good memories, but that's a waste, isn't it, from a financial point of view? He's not done enough to 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 justify anywhere near that kind of money. Considering there's no resale, then no. Yeah, um, yeah. that's I meant you know in the summer maybe there was a figure there to be had, but I, I doubt it. Again, he's it would have been minimum, million. wouldn't it? It would have been hundreds yeah, of thousands yeah. or a million or something. Three million, four million, something. Like yeah, if we're lucky. Okay, all right. That's all the outgoings. Then the, the window has slammed shut now. Uh, no further uh, notifications from anywhere important. Yeah, so well, that looks like the see, end of it. So I did see a message on the chat asking about John Duran and his injury. Um, yes, short from Sean. Um, yeah, April was kind of like a worst case scenario. It's going to be six to eight weeks for Duran, so that would take him basically up to mid to late oh, March. Yeah, late March. Yeah, so eight weeks, I believe, is March. So you're basically looking at, if we're lucky, you'd be back for the first or the second leg of the round of 16 for the Conference League. Um, mm. But the likelihood is that he's, you know, probably about April when he can properly compete again. So I think that is, you know, another reason why bringing in Rodgers is probably quite useful as well. He did say, Emery, that Zaniola would basically be for his backup striker now. And he didn't want to kind of go into the market and just cover uh, the round for, you know, what would it be? two months so yeah that's the kind of um, situation there yeah just a couple of other questions or comments before we leave because i think that that does us for the oh we've got to write the, the window as well let's do the questions first um nick de silva says do these young signings mean villa will find it easier to comply with ffp in the future and may only need to make one or two marquee signings in the summer um i don't know that's marquee sales maybe I think we could still oh those signs as well, I suppose might make sense. If we spent less, we can we can afford to not spend as much. Um do you think that's yeah. correct? Is this a, an FFP situation more so than a signing a talented player situation? Um oh, sorry mate, I did miss the question a little bit. I was sidetracked. Uh in terms of <laughs> we've signed younger players instead of paying it's big wages. Yeah, yeah, essentially, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I probably comes into the thinking. I'm sure, it, you know, we, we mentioned it um, previously. I remember speaking about it in the office that Villa have kind of got two two ways of attacking the, the market, I suppose. You know, your first way is bringing in your fully fledged um, kind of ready here and now players, Paul Torres, Musa Diaby, Yuri Tielemans, uh, etc. And then in January, what we've done is supplemented that with uh, younger players who are obviously going to improve. We did that to an extent previously, but I don't think this kind of level of recruitment we've seen before. And, um, you know, for example, under Christian Perslow, uh, I don't think it was our kind of, I don't think we had the kind of appetite to be doing what we're doing now under Monchi. And that might seem a bit harsh because Perslow had a lot of different jobs, whereas Monchi is solely focused on the football side of things and you obviously got Chris Hector doing the business. Um, so that's not a criticism, but it's just saying we've evolved now um, to where we have a, uh, you know, a kind of, we've always had a good scouting team and a, and a good um, a transfer committee. 
who can find these players, but it's bringing them to the club and it's kind of giving them a pathway and having a plan for them. I think that's the key thing. We, we've got a plan for these players. Um, and Monchi will know what he's doing. He's not just bringing, as I say, uh, Sousa into the club and then kind of thinking, all right, where's he going to go out on loan? Is he going to go out on loan in the summer? Well, he knows what he wants to do uh, and he knows specifically he wants to give him to Plymouth. And there's obviously no coincidence that we gave us as and Kane Kessler to Plymouth as well. There's a reason for the for those moves. So, um, yeah, in terms of the FFP situation, though, I don't know specifically if that's because of that, but, you know, you could hazard a guess. It's, you know, <laughs> it's no secret that every Premier League club is wary of it because what we've seen this window is, what, £50 million spent, maybe 60 or something across all the clubs, whereas mm. last window it was 800. 800, was it? 800. Yeah, a lot of it might have been Chelsea, but still, it's um, a large outlay, massive outlay, mm. sorry about it. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> 60 million is a large outlay, really, in, in layman's yeah. terms. Uh, right, final question uh, from Travis Walters, who says, if both of you had the option to get rid of any players in the current squad, who would you have let go in this window? You don't have to pick anyone. Uh, and what position... You don't have to pick anyone. Uh, and what position would you have personally improved? Is there anyone that jumps out where you think, oh, I wish we'd have shifted him on? Um, Mine would have been Bertrand Troy, I think, so I'm pretty... I, I think Trevor and Chimes were the two that we wanted to get off the wage bill. Um, mm. To kind of go to the opposite side of the question, I think midfield, I'm a bit worried about our midfield now, um, specifically holding midfield. I just wonder if, did we have to let Dendonka leave on loan? Uh, you know, I, obviously that's um, a chunk of wage kind of taken off our books, but one injury to Kamara and we are, you know, Obviously, then Tim Rubin, my presume, would come in. But he's played three minutes of football um, this season. And at QPR, he didn't necessarily play that role. He was playing kind of more advanced in some areas and was allowed a bit more freedom. And I'm not saying he can't do that, but he has you know, relatively no experience of doing Well, he has no experience of doing that in the Premier League. That, that Those are the facts. So I just thought maybe did we have to get rid of Dendonka without bringing a replacement? I think that's left us a little light, if I'm being totally honest. And that is a worry. Do you think that, you think that might have been purely financial? Like this is a good deal. It, it sorts yeah, our yeah. wages and whatnot. Like we kind of just have to do it. Like it leaves us light, possibly in that position. But yeah. from a financial point of view, we kind of have to say yes to this. Yeah, but I'm just thinking in the summer. I think we could probably sell Dendonka for six to eight million pounds without him playing for Napoli. And will he play for Napoli all that often? More often than he would at Villa? I'm not totally sure. I don't know. They've obviously got some good midfielders themselves. So. Um, yeah, I you know, maybe I'll be proved wrong and plays well for Napoli and Tim comes in and he's uh he's ready and Emery's seen something that obviously I haven't seen in training. Um, you know, it's not that I don't I rate Tim and I want him to be playing games, but I just think it's a lot of pressure to put on someone's shoulders. You know, for example, in the final ten minutes of games, especially in this season where we're gonna have a lot of them, um, potentially very high pressure as well, conference league, I'm thinking going for Champions League and already that seems to be kind of I'm not saying the pressure's getting to us, but you know, we've seen a bit of a drop of in performance and you want to change things up, but we know that Kamara can't have a break now because there's no one mm. to come in for him unless it's Tim, who's, as I say, is inexperienced and what's that going to do for him and the, and the team? So I just think Dendonka is, if nothing else, he was just safe and I think that was okay for a squad player. Um, yeah. I think we're potentially a bit short there. Mm. Okay. Uh, there's a few more questions coming, but we are doing a, another Q&A next week, so I will take a note of some of these questions when we finish and save them for, for next week uh, we'll do another podcast tomorrow for like a preview Can I just, there was one on air about um, the ZFC link that flashed across my mind I, I think I know where I forgot who asked it now uh, sorry about that uh, I got it C Lion Eye when is the young lad from ZFC joining up with us I read it was this year that'll be uh, July if it's the if it's the player that I think he's talking about which is uh, Omar Kedir who yeah, uh, that'll be in July. It just flashed across my eyes, so I thought I'd answer it. It wasn't January, it was July. Okay, all right, cool. Uh, like I said, we'll be doing a post-match. Uh, a post-match? We will do a post-match. We'll do a preview for Sheffield United tomorrow. That'll probably be a live stream as well, because obviously we play uh, Saturday, so less time for people to watch it when we don't play Sunday, so we'll probably do that live. A um, couple of questions about Paul Torres, what's happened to him. That'll be something we'll talk about tomorrow when there's been a press conference, and hopefully we'll have an answer to that. Um, Jack says, well, I'll watch this tomorrow, so I've missed most of it. Maybe for a different video, please discuss and analyse DRB. 
we were in the office next week filming some stuff and Diaby was on our kind of talking points list. So I think he will get his own kind of separate video, I think, a little chat about him. Uh, and Dan says, the only bad thing about watching this live is I've got nothing to listen to on my way to work tomorrow. We have uploaded lots of stuff over the last couple of weeks, some things kind of non-match day related and more kind of generic talking points. So if you have missed anything over the last few weeks, you can catch up with those. That would be a great. That's a shout out to everyone as well. We did the best transfers of the January transfer window and things like that. If you missed them the first time around, uh, scroll back and have a look if you uh, have nothing to listen to tomorrow. Like, yeah, John, can okay, cool. <laughs> I thought you were going to say something. Only respond to questions. <laughs> um, yeah, you should do that. There's lots of content on the channel. I, I have no uh, input more. Sorry. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Uh, we'll call it a day there. It's, get, it's getting late. If anything else crops up, obviously we'll talk about it tomorrow. Uh, we're here on Friday, post-match show Saturday, and a big kind of live, po- not a live, a big podcast film in person, I was going to say, on Monday. Uh, so plenty of content upcoming on Claret and Blue for you to listen to, uh, Darren. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining in live on Thursday evening for Deadline Day. Thank you, John, for sharing your time, analysis, and insight as ever. We'll be back tomorrow, John. You and I for the post match. The post match. Ah, oh, the preview for Sheffield United. Uh, that will be live, like this one, six o'clock, seven o'clock, something like that. Uh, keep yeah. an eye on Claret and Blue and our social media channels to see when that is going up. Uh, right, everyone. Thank you. Sleep well. <laughs> what am I saying? <laughs> right, I'm going to end it. Right, bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>